would know about aliens on Earth, it would probably be me. And we need to advance technology uh, such that we can have a self-sustaining city on, on Mars. Even after many years, the fascination behind Area 51 has not diminished, and now, Elon Musk has just revealed the last and most terrifying secret we are not supposed to know. What is this secret, and what does it have to do with Area 51? It seems like Elon Musk and SpaceX might be involved in their own version of it. So join us as we explore this mysterious revelation by going back to the roots of the Area 51 mystery, where the man known as Bob Lazar started it all, and now Elon Musk is involved in it too. What does Elon Musk know? In late 2022, a fortune teller shocked many with his predictions for the future. According to the Daily Star, this fortune teller, often known as the living Nostradamus, has some disturbing discoveries about the buried Area 51. Area 51 is a highly confidential U.S. Air Force installation in Nevada that comprises 2.3 million acres. It has long been associated with mythology and stories regarding alien encounters. Atho Salomi, the fortune teller in question, claimed that beneath the surface of Area 51 lies a tunnel leading to a three-dimensional portal, capable of transporting individuals through space and time. He described it as a gateway desired by many to wield godlike power. Salome suggested that while this may sound far-fetched, Area 52 is supposedly dedicated to occult sciences. He extended this phenomenon beyond Nevada, linking it to similar occurrences in Antarctica, implying a network of such sites. During his revelations, Salome made a chilling connection between this mysterious place and billionaire Elon Musk. According to the report, Salome asserted that Musk is knowledgeable about the potent technologies developed in this secretive area. Allegedly, Musk hinted at this knowledge in an interview, mentioning a secret technology sector within his company SpaceX, known as Area 59. The businessman hinted at even more ambitious projects and prototypes being developed there, hinting at the powerful secrets hidden within. Area 59 is probably comparable to Area 51, a place that has been steeped in mystery and intrigue for nearly three decades. There is little knowledge concerning Area 59, but several assumptions can be made based on what we know about Area 51. Area 51 Revelations When talking about Area 51, we have to talk about Bob Lazar. This story has been a hot topic among UFO enthusiasts for three decades now. It's all about whether Bob Lazar, a young physicist, actually got his hands dirty working with alien spacecraft at a secret government facility known as S-4, located near Area 51 in Nevada. When it comes to UFO legends, Bob Lazar is a prominent figure. He's one of the few people who claim to have insider information on an undercover U.S. project, where they supposedly tried to reverse-engineer alien technology. Bob Lazar has been in the spotlight since the 1980s. He's even been on Joe Rogan's podcast, reaching millions of listeners as recently as 2019. That appearance is said to have kicked off the Storm Area 51 event where thousands of people flocked to the desert, hoping to uncover proof of extraterrestrial life. But it turned into a wild, alien-themed festival. Bob lays out his whole saga in his autobiography. He reveals what it was like being in the belly of the beast at the world's most notorious military research location. According to Bob's autobiography, he was a brilliant young physicist, schooled at top-notch places like MIT and Caltech. He was then hired by the Navy in the 80s and was shipped off to a desert site near Las Vegas known as S-4, which was a subsidiary of Area 51. Under tight wraps, Bob was knee-deep in trying to figure out the inner workings of an alien propulsion system supposedly used by a high-tech flying machine straight out of science fiction. But he was told that this flying machine actually came from outer space. As the pressure mounted and the hours got longer, Bob started feeling worried for his own safety. So he revealed his situation to his wife and his close friends, which was a mistake he surely regretted. His employers were furious to the point where they even stationed guards outside his house. That's when Bob turned to rich ufologist John Lear for help, and Lear pushed him to reveal his findings to George Knapp, an award-winning investigative journalist at Kalas TV. To prove his claims, 
Bob Lazar takes a group of people to the desert to witness a test flight of the flying saucer. But on their way back, they're stopped by the police, who alert the base, leading to Bob losing his job. In a series of interviews with CBS TV, he exposes Area 51, revealing the effort to hide this craft from the public and effectively ending his career as a physicist. Bob Lazar's narrative has provoked passionate debate for years. He has been interviewed several times, and those who worked with him support his account of events. So, he writes in his autobiography, in his So what were these so-called findings that caused so much debate and controversy? His Area 51 Findings Since 1989, Lazar has been a key figure in Area 51 conspiracy theories. He had a May interview that year with investigative reporter George Knapp on Las Vegas TV station KLS. He showed up under the alias Dennis and with his face hidden. With this anonymity, he discussed his alleged work at S-4, a facility near the Nellis Air Force Base area known as Area 51. According to Lazar, this site was next to Papus Lake, south of the main Area 51 complex at Groom Lake. He described concealed aircraft hangars built into a mountainside and claimed his job was to assist in reverse engineering one of nine flying saucers of extraterrestrial origin. He asserts that the facility housed nine recovered flying saucers and alleges he caught glimpses of alien bodies and attended briefings about human interactions with the Zeta Reticuli star system. Bob Lazar reports that one of the flying saucers, known as the Sport Model, was constructed of a metallic fluid that resembled liquid titanium in appearance and texture. In a later interview in November, Lazar revealed his identity and stated that he had interviewed for a position with contractor EG&G and previously worked for the U.S. Navy. However, EG&G stated they had no records of him. Skeptics and the U.S. Air Force have both questioned his reported employment at a Nellis Air Force Base subsidiary. Lazar contends that the propulsion system of the vehicle he studied operated on an antimatter reactor and was fueled by element 115 or E-115, then known as Unnun Pentium, which had not yet been artificially created. This element was later synthesized in 2003 and named Muscovium. According to Lazar, a stable isotope of E-115 generated a gravity wave, enabling the craft to fly and evade visual detection by bending light around it. However, stable isotopes of muscovium have not been synthesized, and all known isotopes are highly radioactive, decaying within milliseconds. Lazar asserts that the craft he studied was dismantled, and the reactor he examined was topped by a spherical or semispherical object, emitting a force field capable of repulsing human flesh. He describes the craft as having two main levels. On the upper level, at the center was the reactor, it had an antenna stretching to the top and was covered in a ring by three gravity amplifiers. These amplifiers were connected to gravity emitters on the bottom level, which could spin around and produce a gravity beam or anti-gravity wave. According to Lazar, the vessel would enter this distortion area with its bottom side going in first. Bob Lazar alleges that upon joining the program, he was briefed on Earth's historical interaction with extraterrestrial beings known as gray aliens from a planet orbiting the twin binary star system Zeta Reticuli, spanning the past 10,000 years. As of September 2019, no extrasolar planets have been detected in the Zeta Reticuli system though. In 1989, Lazar went into detail by saying that the saucer seats he saw were child-sized and he saw alien corpses of the same size. Then while at S4, Lazar reported a peculiar sight. Through a door window, he glimpsed two individuals in lab coats conversing with what he initially believed to be a small entity with elongated arms. However, three decades later, he speculated that it might have been a doll used as a size reference for the alleged aliens sometimes nicknamed The Kids. Lazar contends that his employment and educational records were expunged, although skeptics such as Donald R. Prothero, Stanton T. Friedman, and Timothy D. Callahan find this assertion dubious. His story has garnered substantial media coverage, sparking both support and skepticism. Interestingly enough, his story doesn't end there. As recently as 2017, Lazar's workplace was raided by the FBI and local law enforcement, which he theorizes was an attempt to retrieve Element 115, 
a substance he claims to have taken from a government laboratory. However, records obtained through a Freedom of Information request indicate that the raid was part of a murder investigation involving the potential sale of thallium by his company to a suspect in Michigan. Notably, Lazar is not considered a suspect in the inquiry. Although his story is very intriguing, all we have are Lazar's anecdotes and claims to go on. To add even more problems into the mix, Lazar's employment and education are up in the air. Unconfirmed credentials. Some doubt Bob Lazar's credentials as a physicist, alleging that he was never employed by the Navy, did not graduate from MIT or Caltech, and his only possible tie to military sites was a brief stint at a contractor firm linked with Los Alamos. Lazar claims to have earned master's degrees in physics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and in electronics from the California Institute of Technology, yet records from both universities show no trace of him. Scientists Stanton T. Friedman and Donald R. Prothero have indicated that someone with Lazar's academic record in high school would not likely be admitted to either institution. Lazar cannot provide the names of any professors or classmates from his time at MIT and Caltech. Moreover, he did name one Caltech professor, William Duxler. However, he was found to be affiliated with Pierce Junior College, not Caltech. Friedman emphasized that Lazar attended Pierce at the same time he allegedly attended MIT, which is over 2,500 miles away. Lazar claims to be a physicist and states that he worked in this capacity at the Los Alamos Messon Physics Facility. However, an investigation into his role at the facility uncovered that he was a technician for a contractor firm, not a physicist, and did not work for Los Alamos. Consequently, the laboratory has no records of Lazar, whom Prothero describes as a minor player. The Smithsonian Institution and several mainstream news outlets note that his designation as a physicist is self-assigned. So basically, to buy into Bob Lazar's tale, you've got to believe that once he blew the whistle, the government came in and wiped all proof of his work history. Lazar says he got up close with an alien spacecraft and even got his hands on top-secret government documents detailing extraterrestrial interactions with humanity for the past 10,000 years. His claims threw more spotlight on Area 51 and stirred up all sorts of conspiracy theories about what's really going on there. But skeptics and some UFO experts have taken a hard pass on his story, though he's still got a fan base. The Lazar saga gets more interesting when you realize that now, former U.S. Air Force insiders are stepping forward, spilling secrets in front of Congress. They're basically saying that the government has been lying to us about their knowledge of UFOs. Lazar could be seen as an early version of this, a man who blew the whistle on supposed secretive work on alien ships. But a key difference is that the Air Force officer, David Grush, has more to his credentials than Bob Lazar. Grush was a former security officer who worked with the Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force. His info seems to come from legitimate security channels, and he has more ex-government officials backing him up. Meanwhile, Lazar's credibility is shaky. Journalist Stephen Roderick and author Neil Nixon have questioned Lazar's trustworthiness, especially due to his shady past. Author Timothy Good and filmmaker Jeremy Kenyon Lockyer Corbell, who've helped spread Lazar's story, agree. Let's take a look at his history. Back in 1990, Lazar got into some legal trouble for a felony charge related to pandering. He pleaded guilty, did some community service, and had to go through therapy. Then in 2006, Lazar and his wife got hit with charges for breaking the Federal Hazardu Substances Act. They were accused of shipping restricted chemicals across state lines. It all came to light during a raid on their business offices in 2003. Their company, United Nuclear, ended up pleading guilty to a few criminal counts related to selling banned hazardous substances. They got slapped with a $7,500 fine in 2007 for selling Chemicals Usetomak Illegal Fira Works. But here is the thing. Regardless of his legal issues, Lazar's story has made a big splash in pop culture and chaped who people see Area 51. His Tala Hazmati the Bazi even more mysterious and sparked all sorts of wild ideas about aliens. His interviews on TV and radio, especially with journalist George Knapp, and his appearances in documentaries have kept people talking about him. Some think he's just spinning tall tales, but others see him as a brave truth teller who blew the lid off secret government workings. Believe him or doubt him, there's no denying Lazar's had a major impact on the whole Area 51 saga. After Bob Lazar brought it to the public's attention, 
curiosity over Area 51's alleged extraterrestrial connections remained high. Since then, conspiracy theories about the base's alien colonists have risen in prominence, aided by films like Independence Day and television shows like The X-Files. Even today, new claims and rumors about Area 51 continue to emerge. So, what's behind the fascination with Area 51? Area 51 and Alien Activity Understanding Area 51's mission sheds light on its association with UFOs. While known for military training, the base also serves as a hub for tactical aerial maneuvers and counterintelligence. Situated near a nuclear testing site, many of the test flights conducted there could easily be mistaken for UFOs. The site accommodates activities like stealth bomber tests, drone operations, military decoy flares, weapons trials, classified aviation projects, and military drills. The link between Area 51 and alien lore solidified in 1989, when Bob Lazar claimed the base housed and studied alien spacecraft. He asserted his role involved reverse engineering extraterrestrial technology for military use, cementing the base's association with extraterrestrial narratives. At that time, engineers at Area 51 were primarily focused on studying and reverse engineering advanced aircraft, albeit of terrestrial origin. However, the base's isolated location and secrecy encouraged conjecture, particularly as reports of UFO encounters in the vicinity increased. The increased activity at Area 51, particularly with the A-12 aircraft recording over 2,150 takeoffs, corresponded with an upsurge in UFO reports, adding to the fascination surrounding the base. The advanced aircraft tested there could be misinterpreted for UFOs. For example, the A-12 aircraft, which was composed of reflective titanium, could fly at extreme speeds while reflecting sunlight, providing the sense of something otherworldly. Given these characteristics, it's no surprise that Area 51 has been shrouded in secret. The limited information available about its activities has fostered tales and legends about what goes on there. This piqued the public's interest, prompting them to demand the government to come clean about what they were doing in Area 51. And in 2013, the government finally admitted it. So now the government has admitted Area 51 exists, but that is about all. That year, the United States government officially recognized the existence of Area 51. Prior to this, people suspected that something weird was going on in the desert, but they lacked specific evidence. Despite this recognition, the specific purpose of Area 51 since the 1970s has remained unknown. Information concerning its current actions will likely remain classified for many years until it is deemed appropriate for public disclosure. Today, Area 51 continues to captivate the imagination of many, attracting both doubters and believers. This is obvious in the area's alien-themed attractions, such as museums, restaurants, and festivals, which represent people's desire to discover the truth one day. Secrets continue to define Area 51. Operations are closely managed, with several safeguards in place to prevent unauthorized access. A covert airline flies flights to and from the site, and security contractors known as Camo Dudes patrol the perimeter to dissuade intruders. While much of the activity at Area 51 remains shrouded in secrecy, some known functions take place within its confines. It's a place where foreign fighters are occasionally trained, allowing them to refine their skills in remote and challenging terrains far from public eyes. Moreover, Area 51 serves as a hotspot for the United States Armed Forces to develop and test cutting-edge aircraft and warfare technology, pushing the boundaries of aerospace engineering. However, Despite its reputation for secrecy and speculation about extraterrestrial involvement, any hypothetical attempt to storm Area 51 would likely reveal advancements in aerospace engineering rather than proof of alien existence. Nevertheless, the aura of mystery surrounding the area persists. The U.S. administration has been tight-lipped about the ongoing research at the facility, firm in safeguarding national security. Just like that, Elon Musk, too, has denied knowledge of any extraterrestrial activities at Area 51, Elon Musk's public view. Shouldn't there be aliens everywhere? Musk has publicly dismissed the possibility of aliens at Area 51, claiming that there is no evidence of extraterrestrial life. 
He emphasizes that, while other life forms may exist, there have been no signs of their presence. According to him, we're the only consciousness and life that's out there. Responding to inquiries about aliens, Musk expresses skepticism, asserting that if aliens were discovered, he would be the first person to know about it. And when it came to the possibility that the government was hiding aliens, he thought it was just a popular meme, as the best way to increase defense funding would be to come out and reveal the aliens. However, he maintains that as far as current knowledge goes, Earth remains the only known place in this part of the galaxy where consciousness exists, referring to intelligent life as consciousness. In the interview, Musk reflects on the rarity and value of consciousness, advocating for efforts to preserve it. He believes we have a limited window to expand humanity beyond Earth, emphasizing the importance of seizing this opportunity while we can. Regarding Mars, Musk speculates that if life exists on the planet, it likely resides deep below the surface, having adapted to its harsh environment. Despite his optimism, he acknowledges the unknown, humorously remarking that if aliens are present, he hopes they're friendly since they haven't harmed us yet. Luckily though, various institutions including the government are serious about their efforts in uncovering the truth behind UFOs and extraterrestrial phenomena. In recent years, the US government has become more open about declassifying its documents. Government Declassification Lazar's tale might be shaping today's UFO investigations. It could be why the government is now disclosing classified UFO footage they've held for years. But when the government unveiled Area 51's true purpose in 2013, Lazar wasn't impressed. The man who made Area 51 famous in UFO lore shrugged off newly declassified CIA documents acknowledging the facility's existence, revealing it was used for U-2 at spy planey tests, not flying saucers. The government stayed tight lipid about Area 51 until a year old. CIA history was declassified in 2005, due to a Freedom of Information request by George Washington, University's National Security Archive, a prod in June. This document sheds light on Area 51's past, but doesn't mention aliens, spaceships, or anything otherworldly. Lazar, who was running a private consulting firm and steering clear of UFO enthusiasts, wasn't shocked. He claims extraterrestrial activities happened at S4, not Area 51. He said that it's a small step forward and that maybe they'll acknowledge S4 in a decade, but it seems that even a decade later they still haven't. Richard Boylan, who alleges encounters with star visitors along Nevada's extraterrestrial Highway 375, felt underwhelmed when the CIA admitted Area 51's existence. Boylan insists he infiltrated the base, witnessing spacecraft tests extraterrestrial cooperation with government scientists, and activities he believes a shadow government is concealing. People like Boylan aren't exactly surprised by the confirmation that Area 51 is real. He says that it's just the tip of the iceberg and that the government's got way more up its sleeve. On the other hand, there are those like Dirk Vanderplug, the brains behind UFO Digest, who feel a bit reassured by the CIA's admission however limited it may be. For him, it's a reminder that the US government is always hiding something. He wonders if all they're revealing is new types of aircraft and stealth technology. What other secrets could they be holding onto? While the reactions may not be over the top, there's definitely a shift happening in how the public sees UFO chatter these days. David Grush, a former national security officer, is a prime example of this shift. As mentioned before, he recently blew the whistle, claiming the government's been hiding evidence. According to him, the government has been illegally sitting on information that should have gone to Congress, and he's even filed a complaint alleging he received unfair treatment for coming forward. While there's no smoking gun when it comes to alien spacecraft, just the word of a few people, there's a noticeable shift happening within the national security circles. It seems like some informed people want to lend a bit of credence to the idea of extraterrestrial visitors, rather than just brushing it off as a conspiracy. You can see this change in a few ways. First off, the military's suddenly more open to talking about bizarre encounters in the skies. Then there's the new task force Grouch was part of, hinting at some serious interest in these mysterious aerial run-ins. 
And let's not forget the government's odd behavior when it came to those military shootdowns of those balloons in 2023, all secretive yet somehow grabbing everyone's attention. But it's not just the military brass. Even respected figures like Stanford's own Gary Nolan are claiming to get their hands on evidence of close encounters. And if you dig deeper, you'll find writers getting served some mighty strange stories from people willing to divvy into the world of weirdy sciencei. There's no doubt about it, we are in our resurgence of interest in ufology. Interest in ufology. This Area 51 and extraterrestrial resurgence didn't just come from thin air. It's part of a bigger wave of UFO chatter that's been building up momentum lately. All throughout 2019, there were reports flooding in about people spotting strange objects up in the sky, even some from Navy pilots no less. This uptick in interest got Congress's attention, leading to some serious inquiries into what those Navy pilots were seeing. While they haven't come up with any concrete proof of little green men, it's clear that advancements in tech, aviation, and military gear have got us all looking up a bit more often. And then there's Bob Lazar, who kicked off the Area 51 craze in first place. He made an appearance on Joe Rogan's podcast, revealing his story yet again with a few new details. He claimed that government entities proceeded to wipe his records, including his college transcript, birth certificate, and work history. He was even interviewed back in 2018 for a documentary by Netflix, which featured footage he reportedly captured of UFOs. But there are still many who doubt Bob's claims, saying that the footage was too low quality and that the documentary itself had a low production value. But what do you guys think? Is Lazar's story believable, or is it yet another tall tale? Let us know below and subscribe for more next time.